Hi everyone, welcome back to the Tree Top Chat. This is episode number 15. Uh, we hope that you are uh, having a great summer so far. Uh, last week we spoke to Ludu, who is the uh, head of the tree care division at Teufelberger. Uh, we had a great conversation. He gave us some, some insights to his personal life uh, and also some, some very nice uh, insights um, on Teufelberger and how that company works and the products. Uh, hopefully we're going to see more of the products coming out uh, this fall or uh, beginning of next year. Uh, so uh, here at the Bruce we, uh, speaking of Teufelberger, we had a small batch sent to us of what the, uh, the Drenline Jungle Limited Edition rope, where 5% of the revenue is going to go to jungle preservation. We only have a few of these babies. Uh, this is 60 meters, um, has a, a soon slice. Um, it's, it's not the uh, part of the, the splice program, so this could be difficult to get through the zigzag, for instance. Uh, we also, uh, this is going to come up on the website over the weekend or early next week. We also have uh, this beautiful uh, Courant Dock 60-liter uh, um, bag you can use as a rucksack as well. We also have some, some more stuff coming in from, from DMM uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. So today we will be speaking to a very interesting person. Uh, we will be speaking to Mark Bridge, who is the member of Tree Imagineers Group, uh, which is a collaboration, uh, as you might know, between DMM and Teufelberger. Uh, Mark is a very experienced arborist and, and may even be considered as, as one of the best climbing arborists in the world, actually. Uh, he will give us some, some uh, great insight to his professional development, as well as give us some other tips. So... Mark, you on? No. No, he's not on. He's having some technical problems, it seems like. Okay. It says that everyone else is available to join, but for some reason, not Mark. Okay, we'll wait for... We need to chat with him, I guess. I'll have some uh, water from my Arborisk bottle here. Um, as you may have seen, uh, this app is now released and uh, available for people to download and uh, prescribe the, the app and the development. Technical issues. Ah, are you there? Yeah, yeah, all good. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hey. Yeah, good, thank you. Yourself? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. Um, Friday, sun is uh, shining, and uh, it's a little colder now, but, you know, it's all right. Yeah, Friday's always good, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. So, um, um, we're going to take you through the, uh, the talking points here, so I'll, I'll shoot right away. Yeah, far away. Thanks for the invitation, by the way, Anders. Thanks for joining. It's a pleasure to have you here. So, uh, so uh, Mark, tell us, how did you get personally involved in the arb industry? Has it been your, your job and your passion for a long time? Uh, probably be good if I said yes. Um, it, was, it was a coincidence, really. Um, I was just, I was dazed and confused. And a friend of mine asked me whether I'd be interested. I'd actually been working, uh, a friend from Ireland who works here locally, and he asked me, I'd been doing holiday jobs with him, and he asked me whether I'd be uh, consider uh, training with him, and I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't make a very good story, does it? But actually, you know, it's one of those things that's just worked out really well for me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's... Um, sometimes these things happen in life don't they yeah and it's just it's just worked for me so yeah is that sound quality okay yeah it's good okay. absolutely good. yeah so yeah and i've never looked back really okay cool. so tell us a little bit about the uh, three engineers initiative you know what is it for the people who don't know um Tree Imagine is, is a collaboration between um, Chris, Cal, Ben Stasso and myself. And um, it was one of these things where it started off as discussions. Uh, Chris and I were doing a lot of work together when Chris worked in southern Germany. And um, we knew each other and better from the sort of competition, conference circuit. And um, it really started off as discussions about configuration and um, you know, the, the way we were using equipment, you know, back in the day, of course, that would have been a, a Petzl P05 jammed into a big HMS carabiner with, um, with just, you know, 
frictionless cordage and a big spice tie jammed in the top of the carabiner, and it just got us talking about um, how how we could improve upon those configurations, and we were thinking about you know just different techniques we might use, and it actually ended out yeah we actually realised then that it was um, really equipment that was missing, so it kind of started off from there, and. Bettis had a prototype of the tree motion then. Um, so then we started, look, anyway, but that's probably getting into the next questions. The, the, the upshot of it basically was that we realized that many people have good ideas, um, but that what you really need to be able to interface with companies is some, some kind of facade or some kind of entity that they can connect onto. So that led to uh, us um, forming Tree Imagineers, and yeah, it's kind of developed from there. I mean, essentially, the, the the basic tenet of Tree Imagineers has always been that it's something that we do because we enjoy working together, and uh, we enjoy what we do. And you know, periodically we'll get together and we'll sort of ask that question: you know, is this still fun? Is what we're doing still interesting? It is it fun? And it, and until now, it has been. So hey, happy days. Good, good. So, so uh, tell us, uh, what has been the biggest kind of learning points from from Tree Imagineers? What have been the you know kind of the best experiences that you have had? Well, I think you'd have to talk to Chris and Bedders about their best experiences. Uh, I think for me, it's it's taught me a lot. You know, it's taught me about it's taught me patience. <laughs> These things take a long time to happen. You know, and things don't happen overnight. Is very easy to be impatient. I think one of the things that I think we've done, you know, that I'm, well, proud is a funny thing to say, but it's that I'm happy about is that I believe we have taken the time to review things thoroughly before we put them on the market. You know, we don't rush to market because everybody else is with a product until we're really sure about it. And we've had a number of projects where we got through second third prototype phases and we were like this doesn't work and we just binned it okay so which you know bearing in mind that we've never been funded by anybody we've always been independent nobody's ever given us money uh, you know we've earned all the money and we've paid for everything that we that yeah that we use and um you know that that is painful then because you're paying for that process but as it is work at height and not Grand Theft Auto, no. our feeling is get it right because people are trusting their lives to you. Absolutely. So how long have you been doing this for now? Eek, 30 years. 30 right. years in tree care. And um, uh, Tree Imagineer has been, uh, yeah, there's different narratives. It's probably about 17 years, wow. 16. It's a long time. So, so uh, what are you doing, you know, when you're not uh, working with tree imagineers? What do you like to do? Oh, this is going to look really bad. Look, I've got, I've got a friend, right? He has a hobby, okay? Um, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> uh, what I do, um, I basically, um, it's so easy to get tangled up in your work, isn't it? You know, and then you, I've got my tree care company, I've got the training company and tree imagineers, and it's just so easy to just really... Um, completely go down a rabbit hole and I've, I've been dealing with some health issues over winter that made me realize that um, that's not enough you know you need to take time to spend time with friends you need to take time to just appreciate stuff and just do stuff because you feel like doing it so um, why don't you ask me that again in half a year Anders I'm working I'm on it okay it's a work in progress yeah. I'm working I'm working on hobbies good good so uh, you also have a blog on, on the Tree Imagineers website uh, where you are kind of the main contributor. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about that blog? What kind of things do you write about? Yeah. Um, the blog was... Okay, this is going to be a roundabout answer, okay? Sure. You, you ready? Um, yeah. The blog was... There, there came a point where um, yeah, big, we realized big companies spend millions of dollars or euros or whatever on a brand building, and we obviously didn't. But we realized that a brand, you can build a brand, but a brand can also um, you know, 
develop itself, people's perception of your brand um, can evolve without you being aware of it. And we realized there came a point, this was 2014, where we realized that people's brand perception of Tree Imagineers is that Tree Imagineers and products associated with us are, um, by definition, um, high tech and high end. And, and um, that was never the way that we saw our contribution. We actually, it, to, to my mind, it's not even, I mean, it's become focused on gear, but it's actually much more than that. And it's just about gaining a deeper understanding of what we do. And whether that's through testing or whether that's through events or interaction with people or, or equipment or developing equipment, that all of that is viable. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I lost track there. So the, the blog was something that we decided to do to try and reverse engineer people's brand perception of us to give us the opportunity, or me in this case, to um, talk about stuff that we thought is interesting or funny or annoying or noteworthy, to just push back on, um, to keep people on their toes uh, in regards to the w width of things that we think are important to talk about. Okay. So, in a nutshell. So, yeah, I've not been very good at it lately. There's just been a lot of other things going on. But it is something, I just, one of the things I enjoy, enjoy about the blog is it doesn't have comments enabled. Um, so, it means it's like a very slow conversation. It's none of this fast twitch, um, okay. you know, new media type stuff. Um, I'll go to an event half a year after having written something. And somebody will come up to me and, and make it, well, this is before Corona, and um, we'll make a comment about something I wrote, and then we'll talk about it. And the person, may, the person with a question or with a comment and me have both had time, half a year time to think about it. And it's, just a, it's just a very slow conversation, yeah, and I rather like that. Nice. So uh, in, we're talking about, you know, uh, when you're meeting people at different events. So you, you travel quite a bit and, you know, you met people from all over the industry, uh, all over the world. How would you say that the art of industry, you know, kind of differs around the world? Um, well, Chris always says, and he's going he's gonna to dislike me for saying this, but he always says arborist, um, hyperactive or dysfunctional or both. So you can choose. So, okay, point one, that's how our industry differs from other industries. Um, um, no, misfits are hyperactive, sorry, misfits are hyperactives, that's the quote, sorry, Chris. Um, he's still going to be annoyed. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, you know, if I think back to 20, 25 years ago, if you travelled to an event in Spain or... Um, you know, in Czech Republic or somewhere else, you were going to see v very different things happening there. I remember one of the first events in Brno I went to in Czech Republic, where one of the guys there was using as a throw belt, a throw ball. He was using perfume bottles filled with sand wrapped in duct tape, which is great. You know, there's lots of great smelling arborists in Czech Republic back at that <laughs> point in time, probably because they're all emptying out these perfume bottles. Uh, um, but um, certainly, I think what what we've seen over the over the last years with new co uh, communication channels with uh, social media is a um, you know the, the, the industry has become much more homogenous. It's we've, we've standardised on certain techniques, which you know in some cases is beneficial. There's uh, but there's also the, the prices. There's a loss of diversity. And I rather liked it. It was, it was quirky. I rather enjoyed that diversity, um, which there is, of course, still. I think the other comment that I'd make is depending, you know, there's countries, you know, thinking about Scandinavia, thinking about Japan, and it's, it's always difficult to make blanket statements like this. But where you feel that the, if you're dealing with people there, they're, based, they're people who are switched on and they're, there's a professional pride. There's obviously there's a standing within the sort of professional world, being an arborist. And then there's, there's other countries, and I'd prefer not to name them, but there's other countries where you feel that the, the, the it's much more menial what people are doing. They're, they're, they're standing, there's much less prestige involved in doing what they're doing. And 
you know, in that, in, in that sense, that it's also a different clientele you're dealing with. Um, I'm always struck in America, for instance, um, you know, whether you're in one of the uh, um, east or west coast big metro areas and there's a show there, you're dealing with one set of people, then you go out to the boonies to a, you know, a rural area and it's a completely different set of people you're dealing with. I'm, I'm trying to be politically correct about this. Um, and I'm actually, you know what, I'm not value judging. There's just, there's a very wide range of people working on trees. Yeah. And I think, and there's, there is differences depending on geographically which region, which region you're in. Yeah. I agree. Uh, so that must have been, you know, pretty rewarding for you to meet all those people in different cultures and how, see how people work in different ways, right? Well, it's quite humbling, really, because... And every time I fly somewhere or I go somewhere, well, A, there's the question of I'm flying somewhere and how can I justify the, the carbon cost, the carbon footprint that this flight is generating? Um, and, you know, what do I have to offer to this group of people that, that is unique enough, you know, ex expenditure um, in terms of energy? But... Um, and, you know, I feel like you know, people are going to realize I'm, I'm a fraud, but there is, I mean, I think oh, I see myself as a sort of channel for communication between different parts of this tribe and, you know, just um, going to places, asking questions, um, offering um, my take or my view on things. One thing that I was never interested in being, which is one of the, it, it's not really an issue I had, but it's where I differ with uh, some other people, the way they portray themselves on social media is I've never had any, uh, my interest in being a guru is I have zero interest in that because I just don't find it interesting because once you put yourself on that pedestal, once you put yourself on the guru pedestal, um, you can't learn anymore because a guru can't admit that he doesn't know something or she, you yeah? So uh, I go to an event to learn as much as the people coming there have come there to learn. I know that every person in the audience has a story to tell and how great would it be if everybody could tell their stories because I'm definitely here to learn. And I think you've just got to be humble in these things and nobody's irreplaceable. And if, I, if I'm invited somewhere, it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege and it's humbling and it's got nothing to do with power standing on a stage, absolutely zero to do with power. Nice. Uh, you know, I, I uh, when you talked about you know traveling the world and so forth, uh, I saw some posts on Instagram where uh, you know people are climbing trees with no protective equipment, big chainsaw just standing there, uh, no harness, uh, nothing secured whatsoever. So, how have you seen you know security developed over kind of the past ten years? Well, I think. The whole security, the security culture we live in today is a very modern invention. Um, I'm very struck. I've got one of the sources I use for in one of the presentations I do on the historical development of tree care is um, Sharon Lilly's book. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It was published in 1985, where there's a picture of the guy footlocking, but there's no connection between the the line and the climber. And uh, she writes that, you know, big companies, um, uh, they don't approve, they, they don't really like you going higher than, um, I don't know, 20 feet because you're not really tied in, uh, which, I th which I thought was priceless because it's not something you'd say today. Um, and, yeah, the, the, this, the safety culture we live in today is, is, something, is something, it's quite a recent development. Um, uh, is it the right thing to do? I'm sure it is. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's my take on it. Um, having said that, um, I was struck last year in Augsburg at the Tree Care Days in the Climbers Forum. We had a climber who's from R Romania originally, and he had pictures of himself cutting down a, a Lombardy poplar with no PPE and, a, and, a, and an axe, basically. Or if you look at old pictures from the 1970s, um, I've got a set of pictures, again, people dismantling a, a Lombardy poplar. It, I think it's wrong to look at these people and go, that's really primitive. 
because you know we're standing on the shoulders of giants we build on what went before and i'm one point in a historical process so the small contribution that i'm offering is one moment in a point in time so if you know your grandson 20 years down the road does a tree top talk with somebody else you know they'll look back they'll look back at what we were looking what we were talking about today and they'll go well you know it was part of a progression so i think it's really important not to look back at old techniques and discard them out of hand three knot techniques a three knot climbing system to me is it's is a is a backbone of what we do if you ask me what my favorite product is hands down i'd say it's the it's the ring to ring saver the cadmium saver because i can remember the first time i saw that product all right that is so neat it's such a simple solution to a complex problem and it just and there's just an elegance to it that i find very striking okay nice so um so uh coming back to uh you know tree engineers and and you know what is your your kind of funniest job story apart from seeing people using perfume bottles as throw bags in Czech Republic but, well that um, wasn't funny enough for you was it okay i've got more <laughs> <laughs> thought, okay, so okay, picture this. So I'm I'm somewhere in a trade show in America, and this was years back. It was when when we'd launched the um, the hitch climber and the tree motion, and we were you know I'm doing some spiel on the hitch climber and configuration and compatibility, and there's a bunch of tree guys, hairy tree guys standing around, and and then um you know they all take off. And, um, you know, I sort of turn around to start clearing up the gear. And there's this one guy who's standing there sort of giving me the eye. And he, you know, big guy, long beard, um, sort of caftan, hippie type, um, poncho type thing. And um, he goes, yeah, man, that was really interesting. Um, but um, what about magic? I was like, fuck me. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse my French. Um, I was like, yeah, no. And then I looked at his, I looked at his badge and his badge was Merlin. And I'm like, step away from Merlin because he might turn you into a bunny rabbit or something. It's true. I, I was like, no, I don't do magic. Sorry, mate. <laughs> but it's true. It's a good point. It's a good point. If we could use ma magic, it might, it might make our job easier. Yeah. I do think it'd be great to just be able to levitate up the tree. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> then we... Um, um, we already know because you know our standard question is what is your favorite piece of gear and of all time and why? So oh, I messed that one up. You know. that, right? So well, what is your second best piece of gear? <laughs> okay, we're we working down the line here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let me answer that differently. I, these are roundabout answers I'm giving you. I'm not aware. I'm sorry. Um, I right. think one of the one of the things I really enjoy about um, being about being involved in design in designing products um, is you know uh, people buy them that's okay but the really cool thing is it gives you cool gear to work with yourself <laughs> so I just what just gives me a real what really tickle what I really just love is when you're using a you know a sea lanyard on the tree motion and the new eccentric and just everything's working well together and yeah. you know you're able to flow through the tree and you know you're not working against any of that gear the gear's working with you kind of thing and i just love that when everything comes together and you're in that you're in that st then that that tunnel of flow and it's there's just something immensely satisfying about that Nice. So I think it's just it's less specific pieces of gear, and it's more the way that the whole thing works together, or the whole systems work together. So um, um, I'm I'm sure you have a problem, uh, you know, answering this question. But you know, is there is there any new products in the pipeline? Yeah, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you, Anders. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. So, uh, but that, that, there is, that was, uh, there is that, products that was, coming, right? That was a no. Yeah, no. We've got we've got a whole range of things. Um, very near completion. Um, DMM has been absolutely fantastic working through this pandemic time. Um, Teufelberg has been ticking over as well. So w w I'm really happy. Um, you know, I'm not going to kill him. Um, I'm really happy that um, you know that, that our partners have managed to get through this period unscathed, which is by no means uh, self-evident. And um, yeah, I think I'm. 
I'm very excited with, you know, what the next sort of quarter, half year, what we're going to be able to show you. Okay, sounds very interesting. So, um, uh, do we have any questions from the audience here? No, no questions from the audience. Well, come on, let's carry on chatting then. Sorry? Let's just carry on chatting then. Yeah. So, um, so anything else you want to share? Because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of out of questions here, but, you know, uh, if you have some th stories or, you know, anything you want to tell us. Yeah, you know, okay, well, I'll, I'll make up an audience question for you then. Uh, the audience question is, Mark, why is Tree Imagineers anti-SRT? And I'd say, ah, oh, that's a very interesting question. Thank you very much, Mark, because we're not, okay? Um, I don't think that was um, – this has been um, – Oh, I've really put my foot in it now, haven't I? Um, I here's, here's my thing. I think it's wrong that we make up different sets of rules and standards depending on a, on a rope configuration. Um, I think we should be setting performance standards for our work positioning si systems, period. You know, we shouldn't be singling out different rope configurations. And then I think um, there's, you know, one of the big conflicts that happened with the TCCs and the various devices coming to the market, which I unfortunately got tangled up in through no, no choice of my own, and was basically just, um, you know, how, is, how are end users supposed and how are vendors supposed to make educated decisions um, if products are not certified? Now, hopefully... Well, thankfully, we're in a better place today. We've got more certified products coming to market again. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think certification is optional. Or certification is not optional. Um, not just from a legal point of view, but I think that certification is also an opportunity for the people designing the equipment, for the manufacturers, to communicate to the end user um, the way they foresaw it being used. It's a means for the end user to understand what this piece of equipment is intended for and how am I supposed to be using it. Right. So I haven't really answered the SRT question. The SRT question is, um, it's part of the toolbox we use today. Right. Um, I think one of the interesting things to me about tree care is the structures we climb on are very diverse. Um, if I go to places in other countries, I'm like, look, you guys are the experts on the trees in your area, on the tree shape and um, and structure and you have to decide what techniques work best and um, I just think it's important not to get stuck on one thing and not and then not deviate left or right I think it's not a good idea to get stuck on one thing and compromise in safety not use access lines anymore not have a rescue plan anymore um, I don't think that's a good idea I don't think over engineered systems are very clever I think things things that are, are simple and intuitive and lend to correct use are inherently safer so and that doesn't exclude at all climbing on a stationary line it doesn't and it doesn't force you to use a doubled line for me the way I work the structure I work, the, the way trees are here um, ascending a stationary line makes sense Switching over to double line makes sense as well, and that's just, that's just worked well for me. If something else works best for somebody else, I'm fine with that as well. I don't have it. Who am I to judge? Just make sure well, it's know, safe. I, I suppose you know it's like everything else is very individual, but you know it sounds you know by you know what you're saying are wise words. So, uh, and who am I to judge? You know, and our bodies are different shapes and sizes as well. I think, you know, one thing that I certainly notice is, um, you know, after having climbed for 30 years, I do feel my hands, um, you know, holding on to low diameter climbing lines. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of what we do, the position of our wrists, using hand saws, using chainsaws, pulling on the hitch, your, your wrist is always at an angle. And it's just something that I'm finding that increasingly, and my hands just get tired. And it's certainly one of the reasons that I'm glad that I've, you know, I've, uh, actually no, of my, tier, of my whole climbing life, yeah. I've been able to use a system with integrated mechanical advantage. Certainly I'm glad for that. But again, that's just me. That's my take. Good. So I think we have a question from uh, Douglas Wells here. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on mechanical rope devices? 
Um, yeah, bring it on. I think it's great. Great. Um, I think, you know, mechanical rope devices, um, rope-based um, adjustment devices, hybrid devices, I think everything's possible. I think it's something that many people are thinking about. Um, one of the interesting things, of course, is if you compare a lock jack or spider jack to a um, zigzag, you could say from the way they grab, there's, there's equivalent hitches. So if you, the, the lock jack um, counts the line like a prusik, and the zigzag has multiple points like a vadatin. So it kind of, you know, I think these things sort of bounce off each other. I think, um, um, I think these things never happen in a vacuum and they're, they're looking to existing models. I mean, when we were working on the, the hitch climber, the initial hitch climber design, we were looking dimension wise at the Petzl PO5, the old small red pulley that we were using. We're like, that's tried and tested, that's a good size, let's go for that. Right. Did the hitch climber, and I suspect that when Petzl were looking at the zigzag, they're like, let's look at the hitch climber for dimensions. Yeah, I could imagine you, you review products that are out there. So, um, yeah, again, I come back to my um, uh, comment before is that these things never ha happen in a vacuum and it's always one point in time in a, in a succession of developments. Yeah. Yeah, there seems to be, a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of products coming out and, and you know, it seems like, you know, the pace is, is increasing with uh, new gear coming out. Mm -hmm. on the market yes agreed yeah yeah i think that's a fair comment yeah i, I think, I think there's other questions there that i've missed well you know i think we have another question here uh from uh uh what is your favorite mechanical rope device um look the other <laughs> many a number of people i know they're like you know we've got to try everything that comes out I don't really have that ambition. Um, I use um, I use a, a, a zigzag for ascent. You know, I've got a zigzag permanently installed on one of the on my my ascent line, um, which works really well for me. Um, I think it's a well thought out device, and it it, it works well. The base friction is good. Um, I do. I was using the love to for that, which for for my taste uh, was. Um, to I, I think they're quite aggressive in terms of the release, but again, maybe that's just me. Um, and the, the the zigzag suited me better. Put it that way. Okay. So, uh, um, Mark, I think we'll call it a day here. Um, big thank you for for, for uh, joining us and sharing some some your valuable experience and, and insight. Really appreciate that. So, yeah, uh, so all, uh, also as usual, a uh, big thanks to everybody that joined this episode. Um, if you missed thanks, this thanks. one or any of the other ones, you know, uh, feel free to check our, our IGTV or YouTube channel. Uh, next week, we will be speaking to uh, one of the most uh, popular brands in, in Arbor culture, at least when it comes to uh, clothing, and that will be Arbor Tech. So uh, that should be a very interesting uh, conversation, and uh, we'll hear some, some great insights from how that brand functions. So uh, be sure to tune in for next Friday, and have a nice weekend, everybody. And thank you again, Mark. Take care. Anders, thank you very much. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye.